London, capital of the United Kingdom of Great Britain and Northern Ireland. A city with a 2,000 year old history. The motor behind the British economy. The home of government, of parliament and monarchy. The setting for our great national occasions. The centre of explosions in culture and creativity which in the post-war years alone have ranged from the optimism of swinging London to the knowing irony of Cool Britannia. A city which for so long has been held up as a benchmark for what the rest of the country should strive for. But London has changed. Not just in the organic way which history usually demands, but drastically, irrevocably, and within the space of a generation. It's no longer really a British city, much less an English one. Unprecedented demographic change has seen to that. And its character, its very essence, once based on centuries of shared history and experience, is now defined by what are called its values, a synthetic set of beliefs to which the modern Londoner should sign up. It's also the city in which I was born and bred and where I have lived and worked for most of my life. Well, I still do work here, but when it comes to actually living, like hundreds of thousands of Londoners over the past couple of decades, including my own family members and friends, I have up sticks and left. For London is another city now, not my own. I said my farewells, but are we all in a way saying goodbye to London? I grew up here in Shooters Hill, South East London, on this street in fact, it's right next door to Woolwich. My parents were from Peckham and like many others during the 50s and 60s, they moved outwards towards the suburbs, motivated as much as anything by a desire to become homeowners. Now, as a small kid, I would gaze wistfully at this fantastic London skyline, which I saw as a kind of emerald city. Of course, back then, it was dominated just by the Dome of St Paul's and the ultra-modern wonder of what was then known as the GPO Tower. Woolwich was a thriving, mostly white working-class town with military associations going back years. There was an immigrant population too, mostly accepted without a thought. The place had a strong identity, a firm sense of itself. Indeed, McDonald's chose Woolwich to open its very first UK outlet in 1975. Incredibly exotic to us, of course, as we packed the then bustling high street to witness the grand opening. Coming back to Woolwich to live many years later, it had of course changed utterly to the point of being unrecognisable. A home now seemingly to the whole world a place of countless identities and none. There is little sign in this landscape of what remains of the white working class. The speed of change has been mesmerizing. Indeed, lacking any real sense of overarching identity, the need to impose a sense of community has become paramount. Whether locally or indeed as we see nationally, never have we heard the word community so banded about. But it's all pretend really community was never talked about before, simply because it didn't have to be. If there is a date when the demographic transformation of London and indeed Britain took on a whole new order, it would be 1997 and the election of the Blair government. From that point on, migration on a scale which could be argued as reasonable enough in any country, gradually gave way to the imposition of a mass migration, which was without historical precedent. All of this has meant that a new narrative has had to be put in place and pushed at any opportunity. London, it is claimed, is and always has been a city of immigrants. Just last month, Mayor Sadiq Khan proclaimed that London was in fact built by migrants and refugees. 
Well, I mean, quite simply, the idea that um, London has always been a multicultural city and that it's thanks to immigrants that this wonderful megapolis was built is, uh, quite frankly, is propaganda. It's pro propaganda that's not based in any fact. It's, uh, it's a myth, of course. Poppycock. It's absolute nonsense. And then I speak as a, a Windrush generation migrant. I came here in 1956 and my father came here in 1950 and we were part of that early post-war generation of migrant coming here. Well, frankly, the sort of people that uh, Sadiq Khan is talking about came much later. In 1954, I think there was only something like 4% of the population was, in, in fact, uh, um, non-UK born, shall we say. Apart from being historically nonsensical, Sadiq Khan's claims amount to a gross insult to the countless generations of English and British Londoners who over centuries made their city one of the greatest in the world. It's the kind of revision of history which Orwell spoke about. Woe betide anyone who goes against it. The comedian John Cleese was condemned simply for saying that London was no longer really an English city, something which to most sentient people would be a perfectly reasonable view. Indeed, the boosters and promoters of contemporary London actually glory in the fact that it is not English or British. To them, that's a virtue. It's what makes the city great. It's only been recently in the, the, the post-war years that we've seen this change, but as recently as 1961, 90, uh, almost 98%, 97.7% of London was white. By, by 1971, when you begin to see the end of empire and people coming here, then you begin to see a drop. So it was 93% in 1971. By 1981, that had dropped down to, to 86%. And then by um, uh, 19... Uh, 91, it had gone down to, to 80%. And that's when you see the great dramatic drop happening on, because between 1901 and 2001, of course, we had Tony Blair starting, and we saw a 20% drop in London's white population from, from, from 80% down to 60%. Then by 2011, it had gone down to around 45%. And at the last census in 2021, we know that the population of London that is white British is about 37%. So it's quite without precedent, I think, in the history of the modern world for a city, a capital city, to have its indigenous population decline from 97%, 98% in 1961, down to the fact that it's barely a third uh, 70 years later. So, what exactly is a Londoner, according to this new narrative? Well, it would seem to be anybody who simply lives here, whether they're from a family that goes back generations in the city, or people who have simply arrived last month. In other words, Nobody has any claim on London. I've always found it amusing that those people who celebrate the lack of British or English people in the capital would probably be quite horrified to find on one of their holidays that, say, Paris was suddenly less French or that Mumbai was now a minority Indian city. London, like Britain, is celebrated by our liberal overlords only to the extent that it embraces all other cultures. Its own is allowed to wither on the vine. Just recently, it emerged from City Hall that the internal branding guidelines for Mayor Sadiq Khan featured a photo of a white family with the proviso that such a picture should not be used as it did not represent real Londoners. One can only imagine the response if that had been a picture of a black family. Um, obviously the demographics changed and I think um, the kind of idea of a Londoner has changed. I think before um, people talk about, a lot about London but I don't think they talk about what everyone used to talk about was Londoners and I think by Londoners they meant people like us but I mean people that come from generations that didn't expect to leave the city, people that were going to born there, worked there, die there. And I think that has completely shifted. So no one defines a Londoner anymore. And if they do, it's usually to do with everything that comes into London rather than something that London produces. 
So people talk very much about the multicultural London, which which seems so tired and old now and very 20th century, but they they don't talk so much about what London creates, what what comes out of London. And at one time, I think that used to be very evident with music, with so many other things. You know, it was just you, it was native to the to that city, and I I don't think that happens now. I've I've lived in any number of different cities around the world as part of my job or worked in them or whatever, spent time in them. And that, you know, if, I, if I were in Reykjavik, I'm hardly in a position to describe myself as a Reykjavikite or Bucharest. You know, am, am I a, a Bucharestian? No, it's just foolish. I mean, of course, there are expatriates, British expatriates all over the world. Um, when they go to a, a country, by and large, they retain their Britishness without a doubt, but they do also learn the language, by and large. They do mix with the locals, they intermarry and gradually become a part of the community that they chose to join. What the mayor does, I think, is, if anything, encourage people to remain separate. That, I just can't abide that. This business of, you know, you, you mustn't suggest that anyone is in any way um, uh, uh, someone who doesn't belong by suggesting that um, they're from another country or they speak a different language or they adhere to a different culture. That in itself, I think, marks them out as being different. It marks them out as being different. Now, if they choose to uh, regard themselves as true Londoners, nowadays, what does that mean? But as we did, my generation of migrant did, we regarded ourselves as Londoners and we behaved like the Londoners. We accepted the way of life that we had joined. And in fact, we were all very proud of that life. I'm not sure that the sort of people that Sadiq Khan is talking about would say that about the London that they think they are a part of. For the fact is, to have a strong identity and character, a city, just like a country, has to continue to pass on not just its particular traditions and shared history, but also the culture, language and multitude of nuances that make it unique. This was possible for London when migration was simply one factor in its history. There have, of course, been waves of immigration, whether it be Huguenots in the 17th century through to Eastern Europeans and the Irish in the 19th and 20th. These movements of people were, however, limited enough for there to be pretty successful integration. But now, the sheer volume over the past 25 years has meant that such continuity is impossible. There is simply no need or an incentive to integrate. Why do you need to when you have a ready-made community waiting, and indeed when the host culture appears not to value itself? Population change of this magnitude inevitably leads to a more fundamental break in the chain of continuity. And the decline of even a common language, the very glue that keeps a society together, ensures that fragmentation and alienation will increase. For a brief moment some years back, even some labor voices started to proclaim the need for newcomers to learn the language, but such initiatives faded away as they were bound to. Eventually, familiarity itself dies away. I, for one, gradually became weary with not hearing English spoken from the moment of leaving home in the morning until arriving at work and I'm far from the only one. The iconic London actor Terence Stamp said the same about his East End neighborhood recently. 
Yet familiarity is something which we are not now meant to aspire to. It is thought of as being provincial, small-minded, limiting. It is something valued by what the writer David Goodhart called the somewhere people, those for whom a sense of place and of home are important, unlike the anywheres who care little or nothing for these things. And if London is anything now, it is solidly an anywhere city. Brexit, the campaign before and the years since, illustrate this perfectly. It's often an overlooked fact that around 40% of London voted for Brexit. That's more indeed than voted for Sadiq Khan. But there's no getting away from the fact that the capital was and remained solidly and perhaps now bitterly pro-EU. Being a Brexiteer became simply unacceptable in metropolitan London circles. It went against liberal London's anti-nation, pro-internationalist values. No wonder that some Brexiteers found themselves to be the unwanted Londoners, especially when Sadiq Khan hijacks formerly innocent family occasions such as the traditional New Year's Eve fireworks display to make pro-EU political points. When you hear of a company or a city having values, it's a pretty good indication that what we're really talking about is an ideology which is being promoted. It's a far cry from the communal customs, practices and experiences which over time form a culture. Which, which values are we talking about, Peter? Well, is it the values that Sadi Khan tells us yes. that um, this is what you have to sign up to if you want to regard yourself as, as a Londoner? That, that isn't what being a Londoner or being British or being French or being anything else is. It's much, much more than that. I was always against this idea that uh, really Britishness is, is all about you know, fish and chips, cricket, warm beer, um, values like um, adhering to, to justice and I, there's much much more to being from from a country to being the national of a country much much more than that and and that is what people don't get I think those who say no it's it's racist to talk like that is it is well, it really King George VI during the Blitz said the city is not the walls that surround it, the city is the people that live within those walls. And uh, when a population has changed so rapidly and dramatically, and when that population is so transient and has had no, ch uh, no time to establish roots, of course it loses its collective memory, it loses its institutional memory, and it ceases to be the city that we all knew, and the city that of course has those stereotypical values and characteristics. How do you think, I mean, moving on, on from that, how do you think that this level of migration has changed London, the character of London? I think it's undeniable that we're living in a completely different city to the city that I, that I was born in in the 1970s uh, and the city, in fact, that I knew from, from, my, from my childhood up until the 1990s. Uh, you have to remember, of course, that uh, it, it was recently as, as early as, uh, as the 1990s that London's culture and population was, it was extremely stable and also by which I mean it didn't move much. And so you had distinct regions of the, of the city that had its, uh, their own unique cultures, in many ways their own accents, you know. Uh, Cockneys of East London could easily identify people from South London and, and I could actually identify people from West and South and East London to a degree that you really couldn't do today. Uh, you know, Noel Coward wrote his famous song London Pride during the Blitz where he spoke about the London spirit from the Ritz to the Anchor and Crown and it was that idea that we were all part of London but it was such a huge place. I mean think about it, the population of London is equal to Scotland and Wales combined. It's a country in its own right and within that country we had a huge diversity of a population all all white british but a diversity of, of culture and you know it's it's such a great shame to see the 
the way in which we have completely allowed elements of that culture to disappear from public life. You know, the, the Maoris are celebrated in New Zealand. Uh, New Zealand now has two names. It has its New Zealand name and it has its Maori name. Uh, efforts are made in order that the Governor General of New Zealand wears Maori dress. The Maori language is incorporated into government life and into official life in every capacity whatsoever. It's celebrated. But the Maoris only came to New Zealand in the 1300s, the 1350s. That's the same time that the term Cockney first became associated with London in its earliest form. And yet, of course, whilst New Zealand celebrates Maori culture, Cockneys have been virtually erased from the life of London, despite being the indigenous population of this city for, for centuries. And I've often said, you know, if the Cockneys were a tribe in the, in the Amazon, of course, the UN would have set up a, a force to go out there and serve, save and preserve them. So alongside being anti-Brexit, what other views make up our capital city's new value system? Well, a wholesale acceptance of the so-called climate crisis, for one. This is expressed in an outright war on the car. Just ask any of London's great black cab drivers what it's like now trying to navigate the city. Endless, often empty cycle lanes causing seemingly permanent traffic jams with journeys that should take 20 minutes taking 40. And of course, the hated so-called ULES, the ultra low emission zone, which Sadiq Khan is set on pursuing in the face of growing public anger. London's police have been famously easygoing when it comes to protests by the eco-zealots. The capital is regularly brought to a standstill by Just Stop Oil, and an atmosphere of utter helplessness pervades its streets. Sometimes it feels like controlled anarchy. It's hard not to draw the conclusion that the Met now practices two-tiered policing, which reflects the values of official London. We saw this too during the Black Lives Matter protests in 2020 when the police took the knee to those who were never ever going to support them and facilitated their demonstrations while at the same time handing out harsh treatment to anti-lockdown protests. Running scared stiff of the slightest accusation of racism, the London police now seem intent more on displaying their woke credentials than on facing down a wave of violent crime of gang knifings, machete fights, and most recently, mass disorder of the type we saw on Oxford Street, which shows no signs of abating. Indeed, the branch of one London supermarket found itself being looted three times in just one week. The Black Lives Matter protests triggered what appeared to be a mass mea culpa from London's cultural institutions. The British Library, the British Museum, even Kew Gardens, all rushed to display their shame with Britain's history, with promises to decolonize their collections and therefore delegitimize their very reason for existing. The new uniformly woke official London spoke as one and it was with a shrill, self-hating voice. Deconstructing the past became another article of faith in the modern London outlook. Now, as a member of the London Assembly at the time, I watched as the mayor himself jumped on the bandwagon of shame when he announced a review of all the capital's statues, historical sites, and street names. It would be up to him which of London's legacies could and should be legitimately celebrated. What I do feel very passionate about is somebody basically coming in and essentially saying, I am going to, or this commission is going to start, as you put it, deciding which legacies should be celebrated and which shouldn't be. No one has the right to do that. And I think it is extraordinary at a time when this city is facing almost extinction level event economically, largely as well down to many of the things you've done, such as congestion charge and all of that, that actually now you start attacking its heritage. And the councils that you refer to are Labour ones, 130 of them up and down the country. We all know, do we not, Mr Mayor, that your party doesn't really like patriotism, doesn't really like Britain very much, wouldn't you say? Right, well, Mr Mayor, all I can say is that the one consolation is that it's very unlikely that anyone's going to be putting up a statue to you. 
And also the other, the other thing we forget that's happened in the last 20 years, there's become a much more official London that's largely become from people that have moved to London. So when you're in London, the people that really sing its praises, and I mean, it's a type, you know, to be honest. And I think, I don't feel as if I need to be educated on this city by someone with blue hair and rainbow laces that basically grew up posh and provincial. And I, and I think because of that and because of that take on London that they have and that's, that's far reaching now, that has created a kind of almost new provincialism because they can't see that there were people here before that moved out that have had their London experience and it's in our bones, it's in our hearts, it's still with us. Um, you know, the ashes of our families are beneath these streets. It's with us. We don't need to be educated on modern London by these people. Chief amongst London's values is, of course, celebrating diversity. The ever-increasing diversity of the capital is reported not just as a fact, but rather as though something bad is being overcome. Diversity is our strength, is the unchallengeable Orwellian slogan. But what does this actually mean? Is it even true? Where is the evidence for it? The fact is there is none. Indeed, research has shown that far from making us stronger, diversity, especially the super diversity of a city like London, leads to weakening levels of trust between different groups and a lessening of all important social cohesion. You know, we're told that diversity is strength. Well, it isn't. Diversity is weakness if you're talking about communities holding together. Diversity has the opposite effect on that. And it's diversity, yeah, diversity, of course, is attractive. It's something nice, good, attractive to look at. But that doesn't make it um, an important, central, cohesing force. It just doesn't. It has the opposite effect. And that's not, I don't say that with, in any, in any way, wishing to disparage other people, other cultures. I really am not. I, I think it's important that we are accepting and tolerant and we, we rub along together. But encouraging diversity, I think, in itself, is, is, is a way of saying to people, stay as you are, yeah. don't change, don't adopt the local ways. And that, I'm afraid, is where London, unless we start thinking seriously about how to bring people together, that applies to the whole country. But particularly in London, because so many are now they would regard themselves as different. They would regard themselves culturally different um, at home. A lot of them speak different language. I, and and that, it's that difference that I think is problematic for me. It was recently announced that this building behind me, the Trocadero on Piccadilly Circus, will soon be housing a mosque. The Trocadero is a true London landmark, one which has for over a century been a centre of entertainment for Londoners, from restaurant to cinema to more recently Sega World. Right in the very heart of the West End, it stands side by side with the bars and pubs of Leicester Square and the gay district in Soho. What could possibly be the reasoning behind such a decision, other maybe than to make some kind of point? Speaking personally, one of the aspects of London life that I really uh, regret having uh, seen the last days of is the, is the interaction, the daily interaction of Londoners on the streets. You know, London is very much a city of street cries, from the costermongers to the news agents selling the Evening Standard. And it was that hustle and bustle uh, and the interaction of the greengrocer with the old lady doing her, her daily shopping 
um, with with people who are just popping in to get their local paper from the newsagent. And those brief conversations of 30 seconds to a couple of minutes that people will have, that's something you never see any longer. That's partly because of the, of the decline of the local shops, and we now have these larger supermarkets, but it's the fact that we now live in a city of super diversity. And when you have super diversity, which are extremely heterogeneous, extremely diverse cultures, there's a growing sense of distrust amongst people. There's a growing level of suspicion, not just between different ethnic groups, but also within ethnic groups. And so I've often said in the past, um, it, traditionally in London, of course, if you had three old ladies sitting at a bus stop, they would inevitably strike up a conversation together. Um, today, of course, if you have three ladies together, but they're of three different ethnic or cultural backgrounds, it's far less likely you will see that sort of thing striking up. Now, does that matter? I think it does matter because your daily life is a series of interactions and it makes you feel part of something bigger than yourself. It also provides a sense of security. You know that you can rely on other people. If someone stumbles and falls over, you know, you know, for example, you would expect someone to be there for you in a way which I don't think is necessarily the same today. And of course, it also seeps into that idea of, of a bigger, broader culture, bringing people together. And so that, so on, on a daily life, on a, on, a, on a daily level, on a social level, I feel that those aspects of London life. Uh, I deeply lament the loss of them. The last place that I can see them remaining are in fact in black cabs. And when I have a black cab journey, I still have those interactions and often with my barber, <laughs> with the hairdressers. Those are the last two aspects, but it used to be a much broader sort of thing. London was particularly badly hit by the pandemic. Indeed, its limited recovery has been far slower than for any other British city. Footfall in the city of London dropped by a massive 55%, leading to the permanent closure of shops, services and cafes, many of which have been there for generations. The particular hit suffered by the hospitality industry meant that one of London's great boasts, its phenomenal number of restaurants, bars and cafes, was turned against it. Things have improved, yes, but there remains a feeling that this is a place that's had the stuffing knocked out of it. But perhaps all Western cities, not just London, have peaked. Many saw the 21st century as the century of the city. But with London increasingly facing the problems we see in the great American cities, such as New York and San Francisco, perhaps their best times are indeed behind them. So what of the future? Well, Khan might have been a completely disastrous mayor, but as things stand, his attempt at a third term in office looks likely to succeed. Well, how come, you might ask? Well, that's because London's population simply votes more along cultural lines, not just ethnic minorities, but also the white, woke, middle-class liberals, who've ensured that Labour's lead remains seemingly unsurmountable. For them, it's all about what Khan represents, not what he does. But whether or not he wins, the trends forming London are set to continue. Londoners are leaving, but the population will continue to increase. It will become more and more transitory, a place which is great for young professionals for a few years, perhaps, but one where the old or those with families are increasingly not part of the landscape. It is simply not a place in which to put down roots anymore. For those of us for whom London was part of our very character, it will exist, perhaps, in our heads or our hearts. Coming into London by air with the city spread out before you remains a magnificent sight. On such occasions, I reflect that my feelings about the place the ones I've shared in this program are born out of sorrow just as much as anger at what has been lost. But then a quote by a famous film director about Los Angeles comes to mind, and I realise that it really could equally be applied to my hometown. London is the most beautiful city in the world as long as it's at night and from a distance.